a quality control for NeuroPixels data. And we already presented this last year, also with Alessio, and got some questions about why we should care about different measures for quality. So this year I tried to add more information and illustrate at each step how improper quality control can lead to false scientific conclusions. So it's trying to prove to you <laughs> that this is a step that you should do and not um, skip over. All right, so we are going to first address what types of problems can occur in the output of spike sorter algorithms. Then we will talk about how to quality control and talk about manual versus automated curations. And finally, Noam is gonna to talk to you a little bit about what IBL is doing about some um, cutting edge ongoing developments that they are uh, doing. So, First, let's talk about one of the biggest problems of spike sorters, um, spike sorter outputs, is noise. So noise can occur for a lot of different reasons. For instance, electrical noise can occur um, if a lick spout, for instance, is not grounded. That will, when the mouse touches the lick spout with its tongue, that can result in a noise artifact. So, um, similarly, movement of the mouse can cause large um, noise artifacts with um, when the mouse moves, you can have movement of the brain relative to the probe. And the presence of noise, whoops, sorry, can lead to false conclusions. So here, for instance, you might mistakenly believe that there's an increase in firing rate in your population after a reward or after maybe a movement eliciting stimulus, when in fact, there's simply an increase in noise. So what are the characteristics of real units as compared to noise artifacts? It's easier to focus on real units rather than noise artifacts, which can have a lot of different features. Um, good units typically have spatial decay. So a neuron's spikes are recorded on multiple channels, as we already said. And there's one channel where that spike will have the largest amplitude. This is the channel closest to the neuron. And there will be a spatial decay in the amplitude of waveforms as sites are further away from a neuron's um, soma. There are typical waveform shapes that come from neurons and typically there's a very large trough and um, a peak after that trough, which is much smaller. And there can sometimes be a small um, peak here, although this is rare. Here you can see examples of spikes recorded in uh, brain slices from different areas in uh, a soma that all have this similar characteristic shape. Here are some examples of real versus noise units. So you can see in the first two that the signal does not decay much over space. This is um, one, micro, one millimeter here, in contrast to a good neuron, which is very spatially localized. And you can also have noise with atypical waveforms um, with, again, odd spatial decay. Um, so non-somatic spikes also need to be distinguished from somatic ones. Uh, again, you could also, you could otherwise mistakenly um, conclude, for instance, that there is an increase of firing rate in your region of interest A, when in fact there's just an increase of firing rate in the axonal spikes of axons from region B um, passing through region A. Thankfully, non-somatic spikes have characteristic features that distinguish them from somatic ones. So here you can see an example pyramidal neuron that's been recorded in a way where the neuropixel probe was parallel to this neuron's dendritic tree. And you can see um, the site closest to the soma here is highlighted in cyan has a nice somatic waveform. And as the spike back propagates um, along the dendrites, you can see that the shape changes drastically. And most particularly, there's an initial um, peak that is pro more pronounced or even appears um, as you are in the dendrites as compared to in the soma. And there are similar characteristics for um, axonal spikes. So here 
Um, again, the same data, these are example spikes recorded in different areas along a soma. And here are example spikes recorded um, along an axon. And you can see this triphasic um, shape with a very prominent uh, peak before the trough. Okay, so these were kind of the easy problems to spot and solve. A little bit harder is detecting when there are false positive and false negative spikes inside a unit. So false positives occur when the spikes from a neuron, from two different neurons, see here neuron A and neuron B, are incorrectly merged into the same unit, unit C here. And again, you could falsely conclude, for instance, that one neuron is encoding two different events, perhaps as multisensory, when in fact, there are two different neurons that are encoding each of these events. So how do we spot false positives? The easiest way is looking at refractory period violations. As you know, um, a neuron after spiking has a refractory period, which varies between neurons, but typically is on the order of two milliseconds. And in this period, the neuron cannot fire another spike. So if a neuron has a high number of refractory period violations, these spikes that occur really closely um, in time to another spike, that means that this neuron has a high fraction of contamination of false positives, of spikes that are likely from different neurons and not the same neuron. Now, this is not always sufficient. So I tried to illustrate this with this cartoon. There are certain scenarios where looking at refractory period violations is not very helpful. And there is particularly true if you have spikes from neurons that have been merged together in the same units, but these spikes do not occur at the same time. So here on the x-axis, we are representing time, and here we are representing some feature of spikes. Um, and these are the spikes from one neuron, and these are the spikes from another neuron that are mistakenly lumped together in the same unit. Since they occur at different times in the recording, we can't really have any refractory period violations between these two different types of spikes. There are still other things we can look at um, to evaluate whether there are false positives. Um, in particular, you can see if there are um, bimodal or multimodal waveform properties. So again, here representing some feature of waveforms, which could be waveform amplitude as a function of time, you can see what appears to be two different spikes that are from two different neurons. And these spikes can have different, um, as we said, different waveform shapes. There can be two different clusters that you might want to separate in your data. And finally, um, <coughs> false positives are more likely to occur if this would say unit and not neuron. If a unit, well, actually, no, sorry, this would say neuron. <laughs> if a neuron is far away, so it's going to have. Um, it's going to be harder to distinguish from other neurons that are at a similar um, far away also. If it has a low amplitude in its waveform, if it has a low signal to noise ratio, and if it has large uh, amounts of drift, like in this case. And false negatives is the opposite. So you have um, spikes from a neuron, which can have some variability, for instance, in amplitude. Not all spikes are entirely identical can mistakenly be separated in two different units, here A1 and A2, when in fact they originate from the same neuron. And the, another option is also if there are lower amplitude spikes, these can be simply not detected um, at all. And this can also lead to erroneous conclusions where you perhaps think that your neuron has a lower firing rate than what it truly has, perhaps a lower response. This is in the case of distributed false negatives. False negatives can also be transient. For instance, if artifacts occur at particular, particular times, they can actually mask spikes. And so you can think that you have a decrease in response to a certain event when in fact there is um, no decrease at all or even a slight increase. And false negatives occur in particular um, situations. 
they occur especially in bursty cells. So certain cells have um, are bursty, have bursty properties like medium spiny neurons in the striatum or like um, pyramidal cells. So here's an example recording from CA1 uh, pyramidal cells. And you can see a burst here. Bursts are when spikes of a neuron occur within a very quick succession. And typically, earlier spikes have a higher amplitude than later spikes. So there's a whole variability in um, spike amplitude and as thus spike shape. So mistakenly, a spike sorting algorithm could classify these later spikes in the burst as an entirely different unit. And you could miss some important features of your data. Um, false negatives also occur a lot when you have low amplitude spikes. So here you see a snippet of raw data and spike sorting algorithms typically have some sort of threshold in order to detect spikes. And you can see that denoted by this red bar here. And any spike above that is going to be detected, but smaller spikes are not going to be detected. So here you can see I've colored some spikes that in this case, kilo sort two detects in this data from different neurons. And you can see one spike here that definitely exists, but is not detected because it's a smaller spike that's on the same um, order as noise. And there are characteristic features of this without needing to go through all your raw data manually. And in particular, if you plot some proxy for amplitude, um, if you spot basically the histogram of distributions of some amplitude or the proxy for um, spike amplitudes, you can see that neurons that are where all spikes are detected have a characteristic shape that um, is Gaussian-like in most cases. And if there is a unit with spikes below a detection threshold, you can see that it looks like a clipped Gaussian. And this can occur not only during the whole recording like this, this was a quite stable recording, but um, there can also be drift where a unit can be present at certain time epochs and then drift into oblivion later. And this drift affects not only the fact that we are missing spikes, but you can also have um, waveform shape due to drift can change and spikes that correspond to times where the neuron was at different um, areas relative to the probe can lead to different waveform shapes and be separated into different units when they come from the same neuron. Okay, so how do we fix this? There are two main ways, manual curation, which is what historically has been done um, a lot, and quality metrics, which is a growing field um, that's currently expanding. And both have pros and cons. So manual curation allows you to look at your data more and build a better intuition. You're gonna spend hours um, going through all your data and understanding it better. And you might otherwise miss some important features of your data if you don't do this. And for this reason, uh, I typically don't recommend to go immediately to quality metrics when you're beginning a project or beginning with NeuroPixels recordings, but I would recommend to at least spend a little time doing manual curation to gain a better understanding of your data. And secondly, manual curation has a large advantage that it can be done at a spike level. So there's no theoretical um, reason that quality metrics can't be done at a spike level, but currently, that I know of at least, there are no um, implementations of this. If you wanted to, for instance, separate some spikes into clusters or um, do things like this. Manual curation is typically done with Phi, with NeuroPixels data, that works really well. Although I didn't know that um, Spike Interface also had options for this, which looked pretty great that Alessio just presented. And you can find a link for Phi here. Quality metrics, on the other hand, and there are a few different toolboxes that exist that I've linked here. They save hours of time. So typically you would spend um, three hours per one hour data set manually curating and quality metrics take less than 10 minutes. And importantly, you're also gonna eliminate any subjective biases and also errors due to inexperience or fatigue that can occur. 
um, you can additionally validate all your classification thresholds. And Noam is going to touch on this briefly at the end. And finally, it's very easy to, if you change your mind and want to use your data for a different scientific application, you can easily rethreshold your data, um, or other people can use your data in a very simple manner. Um, I'm not going to go in deep detail over this, but essentially, um, there are quality metrics to address noise artifacts, which I've detailed here, um, and they address them very well. And similarly, if you want to sort out non-axonal spikes, non-somatic spikes, sorry, from somatic spikes. Um, for false positives and false negatives, it's a little bit trickier. And the proxies we use are refractory period violations and estimating by fitting a Gaussian with a cutoff parameter, the percentage of spikes below a detection threshold. Um, distance metrics are often used, but it's important to know that they are non-robust to drift, which typically there's a lot in acute neuropixels recordings. And we found that using a unit's amplitude is a really good proxy for its how well its ice spikes are isolated from other units. So units that are have higher amplitude are closer to the probe and have um, typically do not have false positives and false negatives. And we can also look at a waveform signal to noise ratio and try and quantify the amount of drift. And now I just really quickly want to say that, as I said, quality metrics are only unit based. There's a slight trick you can do to um, make that a little bit better, which is to separate your recording into different chunks, which is what uh, bomb cell does, or it's an option in bomb cell, and then compute quality metrics on these separate chunks. So here is plotted um, the interspike interval. So any bins here um, that are the in front of this red line corresponds to refractory period violations. And you can see that this first bin has a lot of refractory period violations and the ones after it do not. So you would typically want to select these bins. Here, there's perhaps not enough data to say much. Um, and similarly, you can see here that if you try and estimate how many spikes are below um, the spike sorters detection threshold, you can see that these bins are good. So you would be able to select certain time bins for this unit that are good and use these in your analysis and discard any time bins where perhaps there's contamination um, or there was large amounts of drift and this unit is no longer present. Um, I see I'm slightly running out of time, so I'm going to hurry up. Um, Quality control, of course, depends on which question you're asking. So if you're doing opto tagging, you need to be mindful of opto artifacts. Um, and for instance, if you're doing population uh, analysis, false positives and false negatives are less important and you might wanna keep units that have high amounts of false positives and false negatives. Um, okay, if you're doing manual curation, you can still reduce errors and the time it takes to manually curate by using quality metrics as a first pass to remove a lot of, well, junk by using very permissive quality metric thresholds. And then once you are um, curating in Phi, for instance, you can additionally um, automatically load in if you use uh, bomb cell quality metrics for each unit that help you to have a more standardized and objective approach to your manual curation. And it's additionally important to stick to the same workflow each time rather um, than kind of wing it. Um, so the workflow itself isn't very important, but it's very important that you stick to the same uh, workflow each time you manually curate. Um, and Next, so if you're doing quality metrics automated, you need to decide on certain thresholds. And it's important to have a look at your data and um, try to gain an understand understanding of how different thresholds would affect your data. Um, since we're running out of time, I'm not gonna go into much detail here. These are the outputs if you were using um, bomb cell as an automated quality metric tool that display waveforms that have been classified in different ways and um, distributions of units for different metrics at different thresholds. Um, and 
Additionally, you want to look at your data, for instance, in a GUI um, in order to get an understanding for what thresholds make sense for your data.